the Popcorn Digest with Gareth and Andy. Hello and welcome to Popcorn Digest, the podcast about the films you love and some you don't. I'm your host, Gareth Green, and joining me as always is my full-time co-host and part-time arch nemesis, Andrew, Dr. No Means Yes, Raphael. Hello, Alan. (laughs) And for our latest episode, we're drawing our Walther PPKs against everyone's favourite elderly spy, as we return once more to the world of James Bond. But this time, in space! That's right, we're taking on Moonraker. But is this ambitious space adventure every much as popular as Star Wars? Or is Moonraker the worst space-related footage we've seen since the Columbia disaster? (laughs) Find out (laughs) after the trailer. From the most exotic locations on Earth, Moonraker will transport you to another world. Trifle overpowering your scent. Holly was a warm girl with the right connections. More excitement, more thrills, more spills. And guess who's dropped in for a bite? Jaws is back. From Earth to the most spectacular adventure in space, Moonraker. It's out of this world. What exactly are you up to here, Drax? James Bond and the treacherous Dr. Goodhead. Despite your efforts, my finely wrought dream approaches its fulfillment. Roger Moore is back as Jimmy Bond in Moonraker. Only this time he's older. Featuring a head with more lines on it than Pablo Escobar's coffee table, (laughs) Moore takes our lovable super spy from countryside estates to the edge of space in his fight against a full-sized Peter Dinklage impersonator, Hugo Drax. (laughs) With the help of Holly Goodhead, a name that is just one rewrite away from Holly Suck Me Off, (laughs) James races to prevent Space Hitler from reaching his final solution, stopping all only to shag every woman who so much as glances at him in between renewing his bus pass. So, <laughs> Andy, this is another one of our um, big 007 adventures. James Bond special five. <laughs> <laughs> this is one that you put forward, and I- yep. I'll ask, do this every time, what is your experience with Moonraker in particular? Oh, goodness. People know that we're Bond fans, but let's talk about Moonraker. <sighs> It's one of those films I can't remember the first time I saw it. I think especially the Roger Moore films, because I think they were the ones that used to get shown on telly a lot. Yeah. Especially at Christmas time. It's one of those, it's always been their films. I would say it's very similar for myself as well. It's one of those things where Bond over here, it's like every holiday, every bank holiday or summer holiday or Christmas, there was a Bond film on. But yeah, it's not a film I'd go back to super regularly. Which is weird because the Roger Moore films I do revisit probably more so than any other James Bond era. I think just yeah. because they are such an easy watch. Yeah, that's it. They're just so easy to go back to. Yeah, if you're tired or you've had a bad day or something, they're just a great film to put on to cheer yourself up or, you know, mm-hmm. it's just a little cosy blanket. Whereas, say, some of the other films. If I'm in that mood, there's no way I would put a Daniel Craig film on, for example. But yeah, I think out of all the Roger Moore films, I think this one and maybe Live and Let Die are the ones I go back to the least. Mm. And we'll probably go into why a little bit later when we start dissecting the film. I mean, I would say about Roger Moore's tenure as Bond, my experience with this particular film tying that in, I wasn't particularly a big fan of Roger Moore Bond while I was growing Mm -hmm. up. I thought it was very, very cheesy. And it's only, weirdly, the older that I've gotten, the more that I've appreciated Roger Moore Bond for all of its best qualities and also its worst. And I will say that regardless of the overall quality of each of the films, there seems to be a Roger Moore film to suit every occasion because (laughs) they're, um, they're quite varied in terms of both content and tone. So you have, like, the very silly, over-the-top. As much as we say, he's got his Die Another Day as well as his Casino Royale. You know, you've got your serious take on Bond with, for your eyes only, always takes Bond a little bit darker. And then you've got the, like, ultra-silly version of Bond, which is, well, 
the last 45 minutes of this film. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I appreciate about it now. And like you say, it's a much easier watch. It's just something to throw on and enjoy, even if it's a background noise. I also don't remember the first time I saw this film, but the first time I properly sat down and watched it through was likely with yourself on one of the many occasions when we went through Bond. Yeah, I've been looking forward to coming back around and looking at something like this, especially something from the yeah. Roger Moore era. And I think the Roger Moore era is, I would say, unique within the Bond series because it's an era where the filmmakers set out just to make films that are pure entertainment. I say with the exception of Few Eyes Only, where they did try and go a little bit more edgy. They're really attempting to reach the broadest audience possible. And if you take into account the times that people lived in, i.e. sort of the mid to late 70s and the early 80s, they are not the best of times for a lot of people. So the style of the films very much reflect the era that they were made in and they were made to entertain people, give them huge spectacle and make them laugh. And I think when people yeah. talk about these films in a really negative way, they sometimes don't think about that aspect that, you know, the James Bond films often reflect what the audience is giving back to them. Yeah, yeah Especially the films that are made either by Broccoli or Saltzman. Kirby Broccoli always took the audience reaction into account. Even um, with, say, the unmade Bond 17, that was going to be a much lighter affair because he was able to take into account what the reaction to, say, License to Kill was. Yeah. So because of the way they had the formula, it was so flexible and adaptable that they were able to do that. So that's why you get a very varied set of films in the Roger Moore era. But I think the through line that takes you through from Live and Let Die to A View to a Kill is that need to be as entertaining as possible. And I think Roger yeah. Moore was the catalyst for that. And I think that's what made his era so popular with audiences because he is the bond that audiences mm -hmm. needed at that time. Now, did it go on for too long? Yes. <laughs> and even Roger Moore himself would say 100%. that. 100%. <laughs> We say that, but like in retrospect, there's nothing that I would change about it because I think that for better or worse, each Roger Moore film brings something to the table for yeah. a viewing experience. Like when we've done our marathons, people don't know, but we have done like full Bond marathons that take days where we go through the entire series. But the Roger Moore era is a delight to get through because of how fun and light it is and how silly it gets and how varied it can be. So I, I don't yeah. know. I wouldn't like even a film such as uh, one that's you know much maligned like Have You to a Kill. Even though Roger Moore's eyes have been pinned open with his latest uh, surgery, I would mm. gladly sit through that time and time again. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, he's not quite at that level at this point. No, no. Although, yeah, it, it is interesting. I think when we did the marathon for the very first time watching them in sequence you can get a really good picture as to the shape of the series but also when we got to moonraker we both looked at each other i think during the opening title sequence and uh, both said roger looks a lot older in this film uh <laughs> compared to really spy does. love me <laughs> he looks like he's been shot in the face with one of those melty laser guns as we yeah. see in the demonstration where it's like his face is just slightly melted somewhat it's like his face has been like blown up and then contracted, then you've got those wrinkled, crinkly yeah, lines. Yeah. It's really bizarre. He's had a very severe allergic reaction to some uh, hair dye or something. But I was watching it last night with Jess, and she was actually mentioning uh, there's definitely something with he's got a few more laughter lines than uh, the previous film, but I think a lot of it comes down to his hair and wardrobe. Yeah. All of a sudden, they start dressing him in elder gentleman's clothes <laughs> and giving him more yes, of a Buffon do, yeah. style haircut to try and it feels very much more like a bit of a comb over job uh, they give him a sort of a, a Donald Trump style haircut uh, <laughs> for the rest yeah. of the series <laughs> <laughs> which if you notice if you watch from Live and Let Die to Spy or Love Me he does not have that haircut 
and he does not wear those kind of clothes. Yeah. And I think that definitely adds to him feeling like the oldest Bond in the series, even though other actors at this point at least, say like Daniel Craig and Pierce Brosnan, their last films were made at a similar age as to Roger Moore making Moonraker, but he still looks way older. I don't think the cigars helped either. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Yeah. The thing is, as well, we talk about moments before we were just mentioning about watching these films with the context of when they were made, ingrained in our heads. And one of the things that you can say about people from that particular generation is that they wore their age in a different way that we seem to now. Times were harder back then. <laughs> Times were harder. People were rougher on their bodies than they were now. And uh, yeah, it does mean that, like in retrospect, now when you have scenes where you know somebody says like a seventy-year-old can take three Gs, and Bond yeah. says trouble is there's never a seventy-year-old around when you need one, and it's like coming from his mouth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Me on the other hand, I'm only sixty-four. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I think that element just as well as like people wearing the age differently for some reason i mean I, I'm, maybe this is something i haven't looked into but was his age a factor when this film came out were people saying that he looked too old or was it just something that's become retrospectively a thing when looking at these films i know that people said it about like a view to a kill for sure um he definitely was around way too long yeah i don't think it was an issue for this film in particular. I think it only started to become an issue from the next film. And they have that whole thing with him and B.B. Dahl, the ice skater in Few Eyes Only. And that really highlighted yes, yeah. the age difference. And also I think because they, in that film, they cast quite young actresses to be the, uh, the Bond girls. And to be honest, it was mainly circumstance that extended his tenure because... He would have done Fewer Eyes Only, definitely. But I think he was planning on leaving it there. And for a very brief time, they had James Brolin in line for playing Bond. And you can see those screen tests on the uh, on the Octopus. Yeah, you can see the um, screen tests on the DVD. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have the whole thing with Never Say Never Again. Eon were very reluctant to have a new Bond actor debut in that particular film because it would just be too much of a box office risk so they decided to yeah. negotiate with Roger Moore and uh, pay him a high salary and all that kind of stuff to get him in the film. Now, because of the whole Battle of the Bonds thing, Octopussy ends up actually making more money than Never Say Never Again. Never Say Never Again had a lot of production problems and actually ended up coming out a little bit later, I think, in the year, but didn't actually make quite as much money. So I think the Eon Bond camp were very much riding on a high because they'd beaten that rival Bond crew and A View to a Kill is pretty much a victory lap which Roger Moore very much regretted doing in the end but because yeah. there was so much goodwill surrounding Roger Moore after the whole Battle of the Bonds thing it was pretty much inevitable even though they probably shouldn't have done it. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so that's the reason, main reason why Roger Moore ended up doing seven films when he really probably would have done mm -hmm. five had Kevin yeah. McClory and company not done their rival film. How old was he at this point? Right, so when they started filming, he would have been 50. And when they okay. finished, he would have been 51. So it's 50-51 with this particular film. Or I mean, even so, like thinking about like modern day films and modern day action stars, you look at the likes of Tom Cruise, um, even like Robert yeah. Downey Jr., things like that. He's a young buck at this point. Yeah, I mean, Tom Cruise doing the last Mission Impossible film was older than Roger Moore was when he did View to a Kill. I think also just, I think Roger Moore has a kind of elder statesman vibe about him anyway. Oh yeah, so yeah, he does, yeah. And I think even when he was younger, he still had that vibe to him. So I think he was always going to feel older, even if he actually physically wasn't. But um, Moonraker is an interesting film anyway, even if you take out the whole Bond yeah. in space thing, because even though it occurs right in the middle of his era, it's actually an end of an era film because there's a lot of elements within the production crew. Some people who've been there from the start of the series, 
that this is their last film. So it's the last film directed by Lewis Gilbert. This is his third and final Bond film. And also the yes. last film for associate producer Bill Cartledge, who is associated with Lewis Gilbert. It's the last film designed by Ken Adam. It's the last film to star mm -hmm. Bernard Lee as M. It's the second and final film for Richard Keel. It's the third and final film for Shirley Bassey. And also, it's the last film of which Nikki Van Der Zyl did any dubbing work. Now, she's one of the unsung people within the whole Bond team because she yes. was the voice of so many Bond girls from the very start. Yeah. I mean, Bond girls weren't picked for their acting skills. They were like, no, we can do that in post. Yeah. We can deliver these lines in post. We've got one woman for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she was the voice of many different characters, sometimes more than one character in a film. So within Doctor No, she dubbed Ursula Andress and yes, yeah. all the other females in the film except four actresses, that being Lois Maxwell, Zena Marshall, Yvonne Shima and... Michelle Mock. She didn't do so much in From Russia With Love, but in Goldfinger, she dubbed Shirley Eaton. In Thunderball, yep. she dubbed Claudine Auger. In You Only Live Twice, she dubbed My Harmer. In Live and Let Die, rather interestingly, she partially dubbed Jane Seymour. <laughs> and in Moonraker, she dubbed Corin Clary and Alayla Shenna, who plays the the woman at the start who is kissing on the plane before he gets thrown out of the plane. The African job. Yeah, and I think partially, I imagine, because of the change of directors and because the next director, John Glenn, Free Rise Only was his directorial debut and he was a bit more modern in terms of his approach, whereas a lot of the other guys beforehand had been much more old school hands who had been making films in the 40s and 50s. Dubbing was just a thing, yeah. it was just another tool, whereas I think as time went on, the idea that you would get a completely different person to dub someone just completely went out the window. So I think that's another reason why yeah. this is her last film as a dubbing artist. And yeah, she more than left her mark on the Bond series. Yeah, If you actually know that it's her, you can generally tell that it's her, even though she's doing slightly different voices. But y yeah, yeah she was a, a very reliable pair of hands for the Bond team <laughs> over the years. Although it's weird, though, when you look at some deleted scenes with some of these actresses, when you actually hear their real voices, it's one of those things where you go, why did they do that? <laughs> what? Yeah, exactly. I think one where, um, like, Claudia Auger in Thunderball, the only reason they dubbed her was because they thought her voice was too low. But when you hear her voice, it sounds incredible. <laughs> like, she sounds so sexy because she has yeah. this kind of, like, husky French voice. I think it's just... One of those things where it was the time. <laughs> I think the thing is as well, like, to use a horrible phrase that I've just made up, I think whether or not someone's voice was dictated was also dictated by Cubby's Chubby. <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not it did the job for him. <laughs> so I imagine he would have been like, yeah, this isn't my particular taste, so it must be dubbed. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm never going to talk about Cubby's Chubby again. I'm, I apologise. <laughs> but yeah there's definitely that kind of stuff going on anyway but for sure yeah this being the last film for so many people that had been involved from the very beginning or at least from the 60s all the way through to the end of the 70s yeah this mm -hmm. was the last time this kind of stuff was going to happen so yeah it's a really interesting film in that regard and even if you take all the weird fantastical comedic stuff out of it even if it was a super super serious film it would still be a significant marker in the whole Bond series because yeah. especially if you watch them in sequence things do change after this point definitely so yeah let's go through like some of the making of Moonraker I understand that you have been you, you are always the guy that has been doing the research on this I think you began your research for this podcast when you were like 13 years old <laughs> and you would just seen GoldenEye or something like that so <laughs> you are the guy for research for Bond and I understand that you've done some to lay the context, to lay the history yes. for Moonraker. So really, where does this film begin? Where does it germinate? I mean, I can understand that there's probably some push to take the film to space due to the success of Star Wars. The series yeah. can be a little bit reactive that way. But yeah, so what takes Bond to space? Right, so... As I usually do, I usually go a couple of films back just to explain the context. Because of course. 
at this point in the series, the Bond films come out so relatively quickly compared yeah. to these days, which is another conversation <laughs> altogether. But um, they're very much dictated by what's going on with the studio, what's going on behind the scenes, and also the reactions to audience reception. So I think if we go back to yeah. The Man with the Golden Gun, which was Roger Moore's second Bond film. Now, his debut film, The Live and Let Die, had been hugely successful on its release in the summer of 1973. So to capitalise on that, they made The Man with the Golden Gun very quickly. So instead of being made in within a two-year time frame, it was actually made in an 18-month time frame and released for Christmas 1974. Yeah. But I think because of its slightly rush nature, I think also the fact that some of the elements hadn't been switched out, although yeah. I really like Man with the Golden Gun, it came across at the time as being a little bit tired. And also its Christmas release date although Bond films later on were released around the end of the year. Bond was traditionally a summer thing. It didn't get great reviews, and it very much underwhelmed at the box office, especially in comparison to Live and Let Die. Now, I'm going to break down these numbers, because I'm going to break down the numbers for all these films as I'm going forward, just to give you an idea of what they regard as being an underperforming film, because it's very different to today. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So, with The Man with the Golden Gun, it had a budget of $7 million. That was pretty much the standard cost of a Bond film up until that point. If you think of course. from Dr. No, it would cost $1 million. And The Man with the Golden Gun was the ninth film, and that cost $7 million. So you can kind of get an idea of when the budget went up very incrementally. Mm -hmm. So $7 million in 1973, when it was greenlit, would be $48 million today. So you're talking like a $50 million film. Right, yeah. And its box office in 1974 was $97.6 million. So that's their underwhelming performance right right and yeah. that from 1974 to today's money was 604 million so you're talking a 50 million dollar film makes 600 million dollars and that is seen as a, a huge underperformance and that's the disappointing yeah that's the yeah. disappointment right it just goes to show how much those earlier films really truly have raked in over the years yes and when we go into some of these the next two films you'll really see how successful the roger moore era was you combine that relatively disappointing figure with the fallout of Harry Saltzman leaving the Eon partnership and him selling his stake to United Artists, which meant that Eon for the first time had to work hand in hand with the studio. And a lot of people thought that this could have marked the end of the Bond series because they thought they were on a downward trajectory at this point. Yeah. So there's a much longer gap between Man with the Golden Gun and The Spy Who Loved Me. It's more like two and a half years, which is unheard of at the time. But Cubby Broccoli, instead of cutting costs and making an even more economical movie, decides to almost make Spy Who Loved Me like a relaunch of the series, like a reaffirmation of Bond. Yeah. What he does is he goes in a different direction. So I think originally Guy Hamilton, who'd made the previous three films, was going to make the film, but then... That didn't happen, and they got Lewis Gilbert, who'd only made You Ain't Live Twice 10 years prior. And what they did was remake You Ain't Live Twice, but instead of spaceships swallowing spaceships, they made it as boats swallowing boats. And there's a lot of similarities yes, of course, between yeah. the plots. It has been described really as a Bond greatest hits package, which it, it was purposely designed to do that. So it reintroduced loads of different elements, like yeah, Bond had a new look. They got rid of the whole, they created a um, a new look for Bond for Roger Moore's first two films, which meant that he didn't have the wealth of PPK and he didn't smoke cigarettes, he smoked cigars. So they wanted to create a different feel for Roger Moore but when they made Spy Love Me they went back to using the welfare and re-establishing all these elements yeah. and making it feel a little bit more classic I would say but in tandem with that the budget goes up so if you compare the 7 million dollar budget of Man with the Golden Gun the budget for Spy Love Me was 13.5 so 
pretty much double. Now that, in 1976 to now, was a $73 million budget. Oh, wow. Yeah, so it's a much bigger, more epic film. So yeah. they're really going for that huge spectacle, which now is completely synonymous with Lewis Gilbert as a Bond director, which is yeah, weird is. because Lewis Gilbert, <laughs> most of his other films are quite on the small side. If you think of his films like Alfie and Educating Rita and Shirley Valentine. Yeah. In between doing these absolutely huge films, a lot of the other films he made around that time and afterwards were very small indeed. So it's a very odd juxtaposition. But yeah, they went all out on this and single-handedly relaunched the series in a lot of people's eyes. So I mean, this is for a particular James Bond fan, this is like the pinnacle of the series. It's a celebration of the series. I think that's what people forget about this film as well when it came out that you know there's already been quite a lot of road behind it they kind of earned their yeah. place to do a big celebration film as well in that way but also like when i say it's a the pinnacle for a certain kind of bond fan i really mean alan partridge but yes it's a yeah. <laughs> it's it's right up there yeah <laughs> that film is a, a huge success and on its release in the summer of 1977 it made 185.4 million, which in today's money is 933 million. Yeah, very much nearly a billion dollar nearly film. Nearly a billion dollar film, yeah. Because that is such a success, they want to repeat all of that and keep all the same team and basically do the film again. <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. Bigger and better maybe with a slightly different theme. So instead of the ocean, it's space. Of course. And it was a constant evolution because if you notice at the end of The Spy Who Loved Me, it said James Bond will return in For Your Eyes Only. And it was going to be For Your Eyes Only until the release of Star Wars. And it, not even just Star Wars. I think <laughs> it's the fact that Star Wars was made and then an awful lot of other sci-fi films were greenlit not long after. Of course. And it was a gradual shift because it was for your eyes only for a little while. I mean, I don't mean to give the game away, but to give an idea of when this film was made, it opened against probably the most successful of the we need to green light a sci-fi film because Star Wars has came out kind of films, and that was Alien. Mm. It didn't open the same week as Alien, but Alien was pretty much dominating the charts when this film came out, which we'll go into later. But yeah, that gives an idea of just what people were thinking at this time. Yeah, yeah. Tom Mankiewicz came in to do a very brief treatment. He'd not actually done a full Bond screenplay since The Man with Golden Gun, but he'd done some uncredited rewrites on The Spy Love Me. And yeah, he was just like a consultant at this point, just doing a favour. And also, because of the success of Spy Love Me, Roger Moore's initial three-picture deal was renegotiated for a fourth film. And I think that whole three-picture deal is now standard for Bond. If, you know, whenever they do cast the next Bond in yeah. in a decade, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> they will probably be offered a three-picture deal with the option for more. Yeah, of course, yeah. But yeah, because of this... This resurgence of sci-fi, which, to be fair, had been dead for quite a long time, they eventually morphed this treatment and story idea into Moonraker. Now, the novel Moonraker was the third Bond novel that was written, and it was published in 1955. Interestingly, the novel was actually based on part of a screenplay idea that Ian Fleming had for a potential James Bond film, which he did pitch during the mid-50s, and it didn't work, and he ended up buying the rights back to it in 1959. But it's interesting that it's the book that he envisioned as a film, pretty much no elements from this book end up in the final film apart from the name of the villain, yeah. and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, Dying of the Day takes more elements from the novel yeah. than Moonraker, the film, does. Wait, are you telling me that the scene between Jaws and Dolly wasn't in any of the <laughs> Ian Fleming source material? No. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? It's yes. so Fleming. <laughs> yes, it is so Fleming. Oh, dear. <laughs> I think the weird thing for me is, one, 
why this ended up being the last book to be adapted into a film. Because in a film of last, this is also the last Bond film to be in, adapted from a full Ian Fleming novel until the release of Casino Royale in 2006. So all subsequent yeah. films were based off of short story titles and stories and characters within those short stories. So yeah, I don't know why they left this particular book till last because I'm not sure whether it, it's only in recent times that it's become very, very well regarded, but it is regarded now as one of Fleming's strongest novels. And I've read it myself yeah. and it is fantastic. It's one of those books when you read it and you go, why did they not make that into a film? It would have been great. Uh, the fact that they use so little from it, literally all they do is they use the villain's name and one tiny little scene. I haven't read the source material and I was just going to ask, what form does Moonraker take in the source material? Because I doubt that it would be a space station or any kind of... No. I was thinking maybe it would be some sort of like weapons-based satellite, much like Goldeneye or something like that. Kind of, yeah. I mean... I'll read you a brief synopsis of the story so you can get an idea of how far away they went from it. So the basic synopsis, which I'm just getting from the uh, Some Kind of Hero book, which is a book I would recommend any Bond fan to read. Yeah, it's great. The basic story is that M requests Bond to assist in a delicate matter. In M's Gentleman's Club Blades, Sir Hugo Drax is suspected of cheating at high stakes bridge. Drax, who emerged mysteriously from nowhere after World War II, has earned the admiration of a nation and a knighthood, and by seemingly invented and privately funding the Moonraker. Does that seem familiar if you've ever watched Dino of the Day with the whole um, Gustav Graves yeah. coming out of nowhere? That's basically what it is. The Moonraker is the UK's independent nuclear deterrent. So it's basically like the Star Wars system that they had in America. Later gonna, on. Uh, ironically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so due to be test fired in the next few days, adverse publicity could have larger consequences. Bond out cheats Drax, cauterizing ongoing scandal. Awkwardly for Bond, the next day he is sent to the Moonraker launch site on the White Cliffs of Dover to investigate a murder slash suicide. There he meets Gala Brand ostensibly a scientist attached to the project, but actually a special branch police officer working undercover. The murder is revealed to be an attempt to halt the revelation that Drax is a Nazi who is now a Soviet agent. He has teamed up with the Soviets who have assisted with the construction of the Moonraker for an audacious coup. Instead of a dummy warhead fired at a test site in the North Sea, the Moonraker will actually be armed with a real warhead and be retasked and aimed at London. Drax will achieve revenge against his nation's victors, and the Soviets will achieve a plausibly deniable blow against the West. And that's the general premise. Yeah. And what happens at the end is that Gala Brand, she has knowledge of how to work with these missiles, and she reprograms the missile to not go to London, but go to its original landing site, yeah. which is where Drax is with his submarine. So it basically ends up being that Drax gets blown up by his own missile in the submarine. Oh, okay, all right. But it's a bit of a, a weird one because it is a very good Bond novel. There are definitely ways that you could have updated it without having to change the entire story. It's interesting when you look at quotes from Cubby Broccoli, he dismisses the book so offhandedly by saying it's just about some peddling rocket. And I was like, <laughs> not very respectful. And also you're throwing away no. a great story. Very reductive. But I think it came down in the end to a conversation that he had with Fleming before he died in that Fleming told him that he would have to update the plots for the books over time because they would become yeah. out of date. So I think he mm. took that and ran with it and maybe ran a bit too hard with it at times. Yeah. But in the end of the day, because some of these films haven't used elements of the Fleming books, they have continued to be plundered from over the years. And like I said, Dine of the Day has more... Oh, of, yeah, of course. To the point where when they made Dine of the Day, the character from Miranda Frost originally was going to be called Gala Brand. And to this day, I do right, not know okay. why... A Bond girl has not been called Gala Brand because it's a very good Fleming Bond lady name. No, but why would you pick that when you've got Holly Goodhead yeah. on the table? I mean, that's one that was made up for this film, but... 
<laughs> Lois Charles is very pleased that she has one of the dirtier Bond girl names. <laughs> yes. I think the other thing that influenced the change in direction to a more outlandish one, as well as the whole sci-fi film interest, was the fact that they visited the NASA test sites and around this time was when the space shuttle was being developed and it was going to be launched in mid-1979. So they had the idea that they would make the film around the shuttle and release it in time for the shuttle being yeah. launched and it would be a really good promotion. But unfortunately, NASA had a lot of technical difficulties with the shuttle and they ended up being moved to... 1980 but i'm pretty sure columbia did not launch until like early 1981 so it was quite a long time after that the shuttle actually did start flying so yeah. that's why the moonraker spacecraft is identical to the shuttle because they wanted that tie-in and that's why they really went heavy into that whole direction because they wanted that cross promotion of course yeah and what happens now really is just a standard procedure for Bond films at this time where they scout locations and simultaneously they work on the script. They start yeah. scouting locations in South America, in like Rio and the Iguacu Falls and the screenwriter from the previous films by I Love Me Christopher Wood returns to write the script for Moonraker of which he has sole credit. The interesting thing about Christopher Wood is that although he's associated with writing two of the most outlandish Bond films, he was very much a Fleming fan and yeah. disliked all of the comedic and outlandish elements that were thrust upon him. He does describe the writing process as incredibly collaborative to the point where he is literally just a sort of writing slave <laughs> to the producers. And, yes, of you know, course, yeah. Uh, the writer is more a hired hand. He's like a conduit. And you're just kind of like funneling the ideas of others, like maybe about like seven different producers or the director and God knows who, and you're trying to funnel it all into one piece that kind of just about makes sense. Especially with these, um, these kind of like studio pitches from long-standing franchises that have now... I've got to a point where a lot of people have a lot of contrasting ideas of what the film should be or what a new version of this film should be. Yeah. So it is a yeah. balancing act, and sometimes, you know, you fall. Yeah, because he, he wanted Bond to be a more earthbound hero. He liked it being dangerous. Like, he had an idea in the Glass Factory sequence originally where he would be attacked by a, a white-hot poker and that it would be thrust into a chair and like scold the side of his face and stuff like that. He wanted to go down the more dangerous grounded route, but unfortunately it just wasn't the right time for that. And so yeah. unfortunately he's forever associated with the more outlandish films. But that script is delivered in May 1978 and it undergoes rewrites by Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet, who were most famously known for writing the sitcom Porridge at the time. And they did some uh, dialogue passes and rejigged some of the scenes, but they ultimately weren't credited for the work. Or they did do later also uncredited rewrites on Never Say Never Again. So that's their whole Bond thing. Oh, right. For the special effects, they did approach John Dykstra. So that's who it was. They talk yeah. about this on the uh, making of documentary, but they refuse to acknowledge who... Um, who the individual was that they approached. Now, he wanted $2 million and 2% of the profits to do the film, and it was just yeah. too expensive to take out of the budget. And that did not give Cubby a chubby at all. No. <laughs> so they reverted <laughs> to using their regular crew, which consisted of Derek Meddings. So really what we need to talk about now is all the tax stuff. So... Around this time, and it was towards the end of the that Labour government before the Conservatives got in in, in the mid-1979, they had yeah. incredibly high tax, like ridiculously high tax for over a certain earning point, which meant that many, many people became tax exiles and also it became way too expensive to do some things 
in the UK. So the 007 stage, which had been built for Spy Love Me, was exclusively used for the special effects and the rest of the production right. was moved to France and it became an yes, Anglo-French yeah. production. And they used three different studios around Paris because the studios weren't as big as, say, Pinewood at the time. So they used uh, is it Boulogne, Studio Cinema, which is I think is Boulancourt, and Epinay. Yeah, I believe the quote from one of the producers was that when it came to moving to Paris, one of the questions that was asked of the production team is, is it something that you would be able to do in Paris with minimal impact on the filmmaking process and they were like well yeah we can do it in paris as long as we have full access to every studio in paris and they were like well there we go (laughs) you can have the three major studios that we have (laughs) in paris so they pretty much had the run of everything when it came to filmmaking during the making of this film yeah and pissed off all the french filmmakers (laughs) of course yes of course (laughs) they took all the studio space and also they were able to use subsidies both in UK, which is the ED levy, which they'd use on The Spy Love Me. But also France is very famous for having huge subsidies for its film industry because it's it views it as a core industry in France. So it is heavily subsidized, which is why you get so many quirky films being made in France and why it has a very long tradition of maybe more challenging films being made in that country because they're very proud of that tradition and they yeah. want it to carry on. So they were able to take advantage of all that, yeah, which kept the budget down, even though the budget was very high for the time. And I think one major thing contributing to that budget increase was the sets that were being built by Ken Adam. And there was a lot of talk about using Ken Adam, but they thought that a large part of the appeal of the Bond films was his set design, so they were willing to take that hit. But from the next film onwards, they wanted to make that a little bit more economically viable, which is why this ended up being his last film for the series and why Peter Lamont ended up being promoted to production designer for the subsequent films. I think in Peter Lamont's book, he did write about him having a very good working relationship with Ken Adam up until The Spy Who Loved Me. I think they had some sort of falling out yeah. within that film to the point where Peter Lamont was not the art director for the main unit. He was actually left in the UK to supervise the special effects art direction. I think this is interesting to contrast with the modern Bond films because when you look at the shooting schedule, it's pretty much the same. So they started shooting on the 11th of August in 1978 and principal photography concluded on the 26th of February 1979. So I think it was a 28 week shoot. Right. And I think Roger Moore had three days off in that whole time period. Is that when he had kidney stones? (laughs) Yes. I imagine the kidney stones and maybe Christmas day. (laughs) And that was it. (laughs) And um, yeah, the special effects started at around the same time and they finished on the 14th of May. So yeah, I think it was about 10 months on the special effects and they did not use any motion control when they were making the film and they didn't really use that many opticals. So they used a very, very old school technique of exposing the negative and then winding the film back and then shooting another element, and then winding the film back. The wind-back method. Which did work very well, but there was a lot of risk to it, because if you messed up one of those elements, you had to start all over again. Yes. I think there's one shot in the film where there are 48 separate elements, so they rewound the film 48 times, but they did get the whole thing done without... A hitch, And the other thing that they did, apart from the model work, was all of the wire work, which apparently the 007 stage was just, the ceiling was just covered in tram lines just to get those shots oh, wow. done. To be honest, when it comes to that, the wind-back method, as a special effects artist, you must be like looking at doing that eighth element as you're about to do the eighth pass of this on this poor piece of film that's been through already seven times. You must be like... Um, Robert Hayes, Ted Stryker at the end of Airplane, sweating. 
<laughs> by the time uh, <laughs> by the time yeah. you get to that. <laughs> yeah. I can't think of a more high stress way of doing special effects like that. Where any element, no. any part can really just like go wrong and spoil everything. I think it helped that they had Derek Meddings, he was very used to the old school filmmaking techniques. So he was a very experienced hand yeah. when it came to getting similar results but with old techniques the only the major thing that happened like production wise was that their dp that had worked on the spy who loved me claude renoir who was a relative a descendant of the artist renoir he had done all the pre-production i think he'd done three months of pre-production and john glenn mentions in his book that he'd found him one day just looking at the numbers on the light meter or something like that. And he could tell that he was really struggling to read the numbers. And he asked Claude about this and he admitted to him that I'm having real trouble with my sight. And it turned out that he had a, a detached retina. And oh, wow. I think Cubby offered to send him to the, the top eye surgeon in the U S he declined the offer and ended up having surgery in the, uh, in France, but apparently later he had a fall and detached his retina again and he had to retire completely from doing cinematography work. So he recommended a colleague of his and the final director of photography for this film ended up being Jean Tournier. Yes, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the thing is about Jean Tournier as well that's quite funny is that when you do look through his filmography as I did earlier, you know, it's got like um, Le Voyage Dupier and Roger Le Hunter. And then it's got just Moonraker. <laughs> right smack bang in the middle yeah. of it. It's uh, Le Mysteries de Paris. Moonraker. <laughs> <laughs> Moonraker. Uh. Yeah, it's just a, it's a very odd filmography to have Moonraker just slap bang in the middle of it. Yeah, it's about a week or two before the start of filming that this happened. So it was very last minute i imagine though it also helps towards the production having i imagine one of the stipulations is they had to hire so many people within france in order to qualify for yeah any like you say tax schemes i mean to be honest i think the way that it worked that apart from certain department heads everyone else had to be french crew so for example i think ken adam had one other person from his usual team then everyone else in that production design department was the french crew right and as part of that they had to hire a certain amount of french cast or french based cast so they hired michael lonsdale for hugo drex i think mainly based on his performance in day of the jackal yeah and then they hired corin clary as is it corin defour who's the uh sacrificial lamb yes. of this film really yeah She's credited as his personal pilot. And I think her biggest film was, was it The Story of O? It's kind of like an erotic film, a quite famous French film. Yes, yes, it is. That was the film that, like, where she came to prominence. And I think also the part of Chang, although I think he was Japanese, but it was based in France, but it was actually yeah. Michael G. Wilson's Taekwondo instructor. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, rounding out the main cast is Lois Charles as Holly Goodhead. Yep. He had been considered for Anya Amasova in the previous film, but had kind of retired at the time. And it was only by chance that on a plane meeting that she ended up being hired for this film. And then you get Richard Kill back as Jaws because they'd shot two endings for Spy All of Me, one where he got killed and one where he didn't, and they used the one where he didn't because they yes, got yeah. the feeling that he was going to be a popular character. Yeah, how they hid him on that plane within the first few minutes, the African job, I'd call it. <laughs> like, yeah. there's no way that there's any space within a plane where he could be hidden. No. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what... It's magic. It's movie magic, baby. It is. <laughs> no, he's disguised as the woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those Mission Impossible mask yeah. moments. <laughs> but this is one of those instances as well where the producers were very much swayed by the letters from children saying, we love Jaws, why can't he be a good guy? So that's where that all comes from. <laughs> that was a great idea. We love that murderous guy whose staple is biting people to death. Why can't he have a redemptive arc? Yeah, 
Naturally, the writer Christopher Wood hated the idea and resisted it. I hate the idea, to be fair. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just a stupid idea, really, isn't it? <laughs> it's, just, it's, it really it's like is. The, the least likely person to have a redemptive arc in any Bond film, and they give it to the fucking, like, the murderous, neck chomping bad guy that is Jaws. And then they give him a love interest as well. Yeah. I mean, there's more I could go on about the film, but to be honest, I think the rest of it I can just talk about as we're talking about the film. So, yes, this preamble, as we do with all the Bond films, takes up probably what is normally an episode of the normal show. (laughs) Yes, it does, yeah. There's so much much that goes into it. So, yeah, let's just talk about the film. What did you think about the film, Gas? Um... I liked it. I would say that it's strange watching this film now having only just done a Mission Impossible series marathon. Yeah. Because I think the uh, Mission Impossible series where it's at now, especially with Dead Reckoning Part 1, which just came out, I think they're doing Roger Moore Bond updated for modern audiences in a far better way than any kind of like nod that the series has had from the official series since roger moore bond yeah (laughs) you know (laughs) in a way in which it made me think oh god they've kind of beat bond to the punch by adapting this tone before them however with this one i would say that it's pretty good in a marathon for sure because it kind of gives you that breath of fresh stupid air and it has faults it has faults throughout but I still, I still really like it. I think it's got like a, a really unfortunate 30, 40 minute at the beginning where not much happens apart from he gets into a one of those fucking spinning machines that astronauts use. And that counts yeah, yeah. as a set piece for a while. But during that 40 minute period, like not much actually happens and there's no big action. And then it kicks up to another gear and there's like action, action, action all the way through to the end. And yeah, I also think that the version of Bond that's in this film, it has a couple of moments that make Bond a lot stupider than he is, and it's mainly because of the disconnect between the writing and the special effects work. Like, it's clear that the writer hasn't seen what the special effects are doing. Yeah. And vice versa, the special effects people really haven't paid attention to the script closely. So you have a moment where, like, for example, at the very beginning of the film, where Bond is in a helicopter being taken to the facility where Moonraker was made. And he um, he turns to the pilot and he goes, Ah, so that's where the Moonraker shuttle was made. And it's literally a building with the sign <laughs> Moonraker. Moonraker. In fucking the biggest white letters that you've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, it's got a couple of moments like that where there's a disconnect, and those really, really make me laugh. But yeah, I like this film for what it is and what it isn't. It's a lot of fun. But is it high art? Is it as good as the series can be? Certainly not. How about yourself? What are your complex thoughts about Moonraker? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. I think for me, because I'm so well acquainted with the series. I think the problem I have with it yeah. is that the stuff that it's doing that's new is so fucking goofy <laughs> that it yeah. just does not fit with the rest of the series. Anything that it's doing that's more like the rest of the series has been done better elsewhere. Elsewhere, yeah. yeah. If you want a boat chase, you go to Live and Let Die. And if you want any Venice action, you go to Casino Royale. Of course, yeah. But where would you go to to get a double taken pigeon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's no other film but this one, baby. And then there's loads of other examples for aerial stuff. Although yeah. you have to commend this film because it's the very first time they did anything like that. But yeah, it's a bit of a weird one. Because if you take those goofy elements out, it's not a particularly exciting film. No. And I know that because I did my own edit of Moonraker where I tried to do that. And then watching it back going, oh, this isn't very exciting. Um, (laughs) So it's one of those films where it's the goofy moments that make it, but you have to be in a certain mood to appreciate that. It's definitely the most jarring of all the Roger Moore films. For sure. It has a really uneasy tone because Mm. it goes from being a little bit dull to being quite edgy at times. And Mm -hmm. then to being 
absolutely fucking ridiculous. Yes, yeah, it does, yeah. It really swings. <laughs> it has a very inconsistent tone in that way. I mean, that's what I would say about it as well for myself in, in terms of the goofier elements, is that the film for me is quite a slog for, as I say, about 40 minutes. And that's when the film is most being a traditional Bond film, in, in a sense, kind of thing. The yeah. goofier elements are yet to show their head in a more kind of overt way. And it's only like after the 40 minute mark that they start to, the film starts to kick up a notch and the action starts to come into play. And then the really goofy stuff starts to move to the forefront of the film. So, yeah, I mean, I can definitely agree with you in terms of like the Bond part of this film. As you say, there's not a part of it where it hasn't been done better elsewhere. Yeah. I would certainly agree with that. And I think it's a bit like Spectre in that way where it's, it's following on from Skyfall, Moonraker suffers from following Spy or Love Me because you can see where they've tried to recreate what that film mm -hmm. was doing, but they've probably not done it quite as well. There's probably only one element where they did it better in Moonraker than they did in Spy yeah. or Love Me, which is probably the main villain. But yeah, it's a really weird one. I have a very odd relationship with it because I do like it, but then in terms of how I like Bond to be, it's maybe just a little bit too much in places. For sure. I was reading just in John Glenn's book earlier today, and he admits that they probably went way too far in some places. Uh, they got a bit carried away with the humour of, of it all mm -hmm. at the time, which is why there was such a... I think even by the end of them making the film, they decided that the next film would be much more grounded and much more yes, serious. Yeah. I imagine they probably had the same experience when they came to the end of making die another day which is probably the film i can compare to the most not even just because it takes elements from yes, the novel it is. but because it is literally that's where the series goes so fucking batshit crazy that it has to ground itself again which is why they ended up making casino royale in the way that they did and again it's not a film that i would recommend to a casual moviegoer no a hundred percent but that's it for me this film works not as like a casual view, but when I'm watching it, I'm not just watching the film, but I'm looking at its place in the history of Bond. And that's part of the enjoyment of watching this film for me is because it's such an oddity in that way, especially obviously towards the second half of the film. And that's one of the points of the film which drives me back to watch it every once in a while. But it isn't one, like I say... If I was to sit Ali down to watch a few Bond films, that makes me sound like I've got a tape to a fucking chair, but her eyelids <laughs> like, open. You're going for the for the next for the next forty eight hours. We're going to be watching. It's not even forty eight hours. I think we're at a point where uh, if we to do a Bond marathon, it's like seventy. Yeah. If you don't behave, I'll put Moonraker on again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, if I was to watch it with her, this wouldn't be one of the first or second lot of films I would show her. Yeah. This is one of the much later ones. Yeah, and for the record, my wife does not like this film at all. No. She said very vocally last night, this is one of my least favourite ones. <laughs> okay, yeah. I don't get it. I get it. I do get it. It's a lot of people's least favourite one. It is a bit of a Marmite film, and again, it's not one of my favourites either. No, same. But I will happily sit and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> which is more than can be said for some Bond films I think something that you've mentioned though that is part of the issue with this film for me and you've mentioned that the bad guy in Hugo Drax is somewhat better than the one from The Spy Who Loved Me is that Stromberg in that one yeah yeah I agree I think he's a better variation of that role yeah but I think these are two villains next to each other that in terms of how much excitement that they drive they're not much of a physical presence, either of them. No. And when it comes to, like, the big showdown, it's kind of anticlimactic. One accidentally shoots himself in the balls, and uh, <laughs> yeah. this one kind of <laughs> bumps into James Bond in a uh, space station corridor and then gets pushed out of an airlock. Yeah. This is at a point where I wish we had someone with a bit more menace and maybe a touch more physical presence as well. And I don't mean that for, like, grappling or fighting in that kind of way, but just, like, I think there needed to be a better distinction of villain from one film to the next, because this feels very much much of a muchness. You know, it's very samey. Yeah, 
it's interesting as well that it's at this point where Roger Moore becomes less of a physical performer. If you look at his first three films, he gets involved with the action quite heavily. And then from yeah. Moonraker onwards, he becomes a little bit more passive or less active, becomes less of an action hero. I mean, to be honest, the 4K HD transfer that I watched, it was supposedly in 4K. Yeah, um, but I imagine that's just an upscaling thing. I've spoken about this previously, but it isn't kind to lead actors when it comes to stunt work because yeah. the stuntmen that are being used for Roger Moore in this film look precisely nothing like Roger Moore. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And you can see it as clear as day. But obviously, these films, when they were conceived and when they were made, home video wasn't even a thought. Never mind yeah. 4K or the type of ways that we watch them now. But even when they would have been projected in cinemas, they would not be at the same clarity as we would no. get today or what we view in 4K. Because if you ever watch an old movie print, there's a lot of grain and a lot of grit there. Yes. Yeah. Which is cool, but it hides a lot of the uh, a lot of things. They weren't making these films to be scrutinized in the way that they are now. Yeah. Which is why in like the aerial sequence you can see things like the glasses that people wear. Yes. And yeah. It's very obvious that Jaws is not being played by Jaws and, and that kind of thing. But I think if you'd watched it back in the day on a cinema screen in nineteen seventy nine, you probably wouldn't have noticed that much. Exactly. And, I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but one thing I will say is I went to see Oppenheimer, the uh, 70mm version at my nearest IMAX, and I have to say that it was a delight to see a film that had dirt on it and the occasional hair stuck in the projector. <laughs> you know? I was like, every time it came off, like, oh, cinema's back, baby. <laughs> you know, there's something, like, really just nostalgic about seeing it. I mean, obviously, I was watching this devastating film about Hiroshima and one of the darkest days in the American military's history. And I'm sat there going, this grain looks so fucking good. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Did you see that hair on the lens? Uh. <laughs> and one thing as well about that opening sequence with the skydive, John Glenn was the secondary director on this film. So he did a lot of the action and obviously the editing as well. The action does feel very John Glenn in that way. It's like it's yeah. cut for speed and for flow. Not so much for logic in terms of... Like in this one, there's a fight in a glass antique shop and people get thrown into glass cabinets but just seemingly bounce back up and it's just because of that kind of like editing style. We don't see yeah. like the clearly what it should have taken five minutes of just utter recovery that Roger Moore should have had after being just yeeted into a glass cabinet, just totally winded. Instead, he's back on his feet in seconds. I like that kind of John Glenn style as well. But I think it really comes together in terms of that skydiving sequence. And again, it reminds me of Mission Impossible. There was a clip from the new Mission Impossible film. And I say that, I mean, the next one that comes out, part two, Dead Reckoning or whatever. And mm -hmm. clearly... Tom Cruise is going to be doing a skydiving stunt. And there's also the one from the previous film as well, Fallout. And the way that they talk about how they shot that and how many times they had to do that skydive. And one of the things John Glenn said that seemed to resonate with something that they said for the Mission Impossible films is that each time they did it, it was a three-second shot cut. Yeah. So it's like every time they did it, they were looking to get three seconds. Yeah. And it took them 80 times to have the coverage. And that kind of dedication to that, it just shows you, like, I, I miss... I say I miss. I do miss that kind of filmmaking being more prevalent in Hollywood. We still do have it. Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie are dragging it back up. And I hope it becomes a much bigger thing now, especially in this year where all bets are off in terms of what sticks and what doesn't. Yeah, But yeah, I love that that type of filmmaking is still alive in a way as well. Like, Because that was another thing that was every time they did a jump, they were like, let's just get a few seconds each time and we'll do it 60 times, <laughs> you know? Yeah, because it was storyboarded for those three second shots because they knew that's how much time they would have before they'd have to deploy the parachutes and also because the cameraman, because they had this special camera, which was a lightweight camera with a plastic anamorphic lens that could hold 100 feet of film 
which was considerably lighter than a normal film camera, and it meant they could film in 35mm instead of 16mm, which is what had traditionally been used before then. It meant that in order to save the cameraman's neck when they deployed the parachute, he had to tie a rope around the parachute so it would open a lot slower. Yeah. But it meant that it actually opened about two to three times slower than a normal one. So it meant that the amount of time they had before they had to stop so he wouldn't hit the ground really hard, would be significantly less. So they had to plan for this, but then also they had to be adaptable and change things if things slightly went awry. So he said it was a balance between following the storyboards, but then adapting something if something else happened. Of course, yeah. That's something that that happens within the Bond team anyway, and has done ever since it started. If, say, if something happens by accident, they usually run with it and incorporate it into the action. And it's usually ended up helping the sequence and made it better, (laughs) usually. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's interesting about the editing as well, because John Glenn was pretty much a student of Peter Hunt, who was the original editor on the Bond films. I mean, Peter Hunt did um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, didn't he? Yeah, it's really weird. With On Her Majesty's, Peter Hunt directed and John Glenn did a lot of the second unit. So he did all the stuff like the bobsled chase at the end and stuff like that, and he edited the film. Now, John Glenn did not work on another Bond film until The Spy Who Loved Me. So in there's about three films in between which he didn't work on as an editor, and it's very showing. Yes, it is, it is. Some of the editing work in those films... Baggy. Yeah, the most jarring of those is probably Diamonds Are Forever. The contrast is very marked because you go from... On a Majesty's, which is very slickly edited, it's a very mm. posh film, to something like Diamonds, which is very flabby and very seedy. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he didn't do those middle films, and yeah, he came back for Spy Love Me and Moonraker. But yeah, that whole style is very Peter Hunt. You can tell that he's learned from the master and brought that yes. through. Yeah, The one boo-boo really is the fucking double taking pigeon which yeah. <laughs> yeah is this film's slide whistle it's literally the analogy i was going to make yeah. myself <laughs> as ridiculous as this film is that double taking pigeon is the slide whistle of this film yeah it's a step too far yeah i mean and that says a lot considering this film has a lot of space battles and laser mm-hmm. battles and whatnot and we're like that fucking double taking pigeon just ruined yeah. the immersion for me <laughs> you know i was really really engaged <laughs> So one question to ask as well is where does this film rank in terms of the opening title sequence for you and in terms of the title song? I would say it's probably in the mid to lower echelons, I would say. It's definitely not one of the worst. It's probably not even mid-tier, but it's kind of just below mid-tier, I'd say. Yeah. I think it's got the worst segue into a Bond song. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Of all of them. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I was watching it this time, and I don't mind the song. The song's fine. But in terms of the graphics, they don't seem as sharp as they usually are. And it seems to be a lot more kind of like blemishes in a few places here and there as well. I know at one point, I mean, again, I'm watching it on, yeah. on like higher res. But like... On one of the silhouettes, there happened to be a white dot where the lady's anus would have been as well. And I was like, that's an unfortunate (laughs) special effects hiccup. (laughs) I mean, there is a story behind that, why it is the way that it is. And it is down to the song. So it's one of those songs that ended up having to go through numerous iterations and Ah, numerous singers to get the final version. So the original version of the song was written by John Barry and Paul Williams right. for Frank Sinatra. Oh. And he was originally going to do it and had agreed to do it because he was a friend of Cubby. And then all of a sudden he wasn't a friend of Cubby and dropped out. So I think they had some sort of, I imagine some sort of gambling dispute <laughs> usually with Cubby. <laughs> some sort of dispute like that, I imagine, and dropped out. And then they offered the song to Kate Bush, who right. 
turned it down. There was some sort of scheduling issue. And then it went to Johnny Mathis, and they recorded a version with Johnny Mathis, but it didn't work out. And I think there was an issue with the song. It's a bit unclear as to whether the song changed before Johnny Mathis or after Johnny Mathis, but basically that session didn't work out. And the producers wanted to retool the song and they wanted to change some of the words. And Paul Williams pretty much talked himself out of making the changes, saying that if it was good enough for Frank Sinatra, it was done. Mm. When he kind of later regrets, like, I should have said that we could have changed it and made it better, but he ended up being taken off the songwriting duties and they got Hal David to come in and write some new lyrics, although I think they completely retooled the whole song. So this ended up being quite last minute, and it was mm-hmm. only by chance that they ran into Shirley Bassey in L.A., and the song was recorded in its final form in L.A. So at this point, it ended up being delivered very late, which meant that the titles right, right. had to be made very quickly to the point where the titles were cut into the premiere version of the film. Right, okay. See, that now that makes a lot of sense. I didn't have any idea about that backstory, but I, I was watching it, I was thinking, it's a little bit, it's just a little bit rougher than I was used to from this crew. Yeah, and also it meant that Morris Binder had no song to actually plan to either, so it was yeah. just a bit of a mess. So, yeah, Frank Sinatra's fault. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, it's an interesting thing as well because we've mentioned, like, the whole tax situation. So, at this point, Cubby Broccoli was a tax exile. He'd moved back to Beverly Hills after having lived in London for 25 years. Roger Moore was living, I think, in Switzerland. John Barry was also a tax exile, which is, explains why he dips in and out of the series, which is why he didn't do yes, Spy Who yeah. Loved Me, and also why he didn't do For Your Eyes Only. And the main reason he did this film is because it was based in France. So he was able to write the score and record the score in Paris. Right. And that's the reason why he, did, he was able to do this film. I mean, when it comes to John Barry's score, I mean, it's... It's lovely as ever. Yeah. But I think this one falls into the the trap of reusing too many of the previous themes. I understand that it's like uh, still continuing that celebration of Bond theme. Yeah. But at times it actually gets in the way of the kind of like enjoyment or the excitement of the action. For example, there's a uh, boat chase when, you know, Jaws mm-hmm. is in one speed boat chasing Bond and... They play that, I forgot what the track's called, but that kind of like secondary Bond. The 007 theme. There we go, yeah, the 007 theme. Yeah. And it just does not suit the action whatsoever. It kind of like takes it away because, I mean, there's no sense of danger in this film, but there's no sense of threat either there because of it. It feels more like a kind of like jolly jaunt. I think in a way it almost kind of shows that it's dated beyond use at this point a little bit. Yeah, and interesting, again, this film being a film of last, this is the last time the 007 theme is heard, and it hadn't yeah. been incorporated into a film for quite some time. I'm trying to think the last time, it, I think he might have, there's a bit of it, I think, in Diamonds. Yeah. But yeah, it, it was John Barry's alternative Bond theme, and it never really caught on in the same way, I think, much to John no. Barry's chagrin my mum and dad were huge fans of the 007 theme because they had it on a uh i, I believe my gran and granddad had it on vinyl uh on one side of the single was the yeah. james bond theme as we know it now and on the other side was 007 theme and they used to play that one a lot apparently <laughs> yeah i think it comes down to like royalty splits because apparently every time john barry did a score they had to and i think this happens when everybody does a bond score they have to split the royalties based on which bit's Monty Norman's and which bit is the composer's. And I think that's why John Barry was trying to edge out the Monty Norman Bond theme in favour of his own and not use it very much at all. And I think it's quite prevalent in this particular film because the Bond theme is not used that much. Yeah, I don't think it's beyond John Barry to be somewhat that petty when it comes to his music as well and being very much like well they're paying me for it i might as well see if i can milk a few more quid from this experience (laughs) i think one thing that i just want to mention as well in terms of the um the sound effects in this film 
Yeah. There's a lot of alien Nostromo sound effects in here, which obviously was not done intentionally. It's just like they came from the same sound effects library because Alien came out at the same time as this film. But I always find it distracting when a door opens or I hear a certain beep and I'm like, hey, it's the Nostromo. <laughs> that has a lot of overlap. But um, yeah. one thing I really did want to get into is how during that scene in which Bond goes on the centrifuge, I'm sure during the dying seconds of that sequence, I witnessed what can only be described as Roger Moore's vinegar strokes. <laughs> Because at one point I was like, he's enjoying this, the kinky bastard, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Don't look down there. I've just I've spilt a very small <laughs> amount of liquid just on my crotch. Oh. <laughs> he was very sweaty. Yes, he is, yeah. And he had that look of, you disturbed me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In fact, one of, the things, <laughs> one of the things that I like about this film is just how much Holly Goodhead detests him and everything he stands for. Everything that he is, it's even a wonder that he manages to bed her because she is yeah, not a fan yeah. whatsoever. No. It's like every time the camera cuts to her and she's seeing Bond, it's like, this motherfucker again. Oh, fuck. Yeah. I think that is partly them trying to recreate what they'd done with Bond and Anya in the previous film. But the issue yeah. is with that film, because it was a British agent paired up with a Russian agent, you had that inbuilt conflict. Whereas of course, yeah. A British agent and a CIA agent isn't quite the same thing. So the conflict seems a little bit more forced. They're on the same side. Yeah. And also I feel like Roger Moore and Barbara Bach in that film had a slightly better chemistry than Roger Moore and Lois Charles do in this film. For sure. I mean, no offense to her. I know, I know that she does a great cameo on Austin Powers. Yeah, <laughs> which is amazing. But I think she's one of the weaker links in this film because, and I don't think it's so much so because of her performance. I think it's because of the way the character is written. She's so one note and emotionless throughout. And it's like, to be honest, Bond represents that. Bond is that kind of like yeah, emotionless, quippy guy. You know, he's it's all water off a duck's back. Out of a pair of them, especially in a film where they go to fucking space, they needed someone to be like, holy shit, what are we doing? Like, in awe and somewhat excited by this whole endeavor. Instead, they're both just a yeah. bit stoic and professional and getting it done. You know, I, I don't want Temple of Doom, what's the name, screaming at every moment, who I don't mind anyway. But yeah, I just need someone to recognize the immensity of the situation. And that's something that I think other Bond films have done really well. I think that's also down to the direction as well yes, because yeah, yeah. I was reading earlier about the fact I think she kept getting quite upset when filming because of that issue and she kept wanting to try and give her character a bit more depth and nuance and was repeatedly told to stop doing that and tone it down and just be this stock figure and I think yeah. she really was not super happy about doing that. I can understand. So, yeah, so it's just one of those where it's unfortunately just down to the direction that they wanted to do with that, which wasn't very much. <laughs> no, no. Another thing that I think is worth mentioning, and uh, I'm getting into all of like the fiddly bits now that I've written yeah, notes yeah. about that I'd want to uh, make sure that we at least cover in the episode, even if it's in passing. But there is an unsung hero of this film, and that is the knife thrower that's um, sat in a coffin for God knows how long, <laughs> waiting for Bond to pass him in his little Venice boat. And it made me oh. think, what must have the audition process been for a henchman of that stature? Because if the guy had a gun or a semi-automatic or that kind of thing, Bond's dead, everybody's dead, film's over. And yeah. I can just imagine like the audition process and it's like, um, so you probably want a gun for this? And he's like, nah, it's not really uh, my scene, that actually. Yeah. It's like, are you sure we could give you a pretty decent semi-automatic, you know, something that can do some damage? It's like, nah, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to throw some knives at him, but not him first. I'm going to make sure I get just some innocent bystander first. <laughs> I said, oh, right, okay. He says, he's like, that's my signature. That's what I do. And he says, oh, are you any good at it? He's like, nah, not really. Oh. It's like, you're hired. <laughs> It's the most 
carry on that Bond ever gets that whole sequence. And we get Alfie Bass as well in oh, reaction yeah. to it as well. I mean, yeah, it's interesting with Alfie Bass because um, it's that Lewis Gilbert connection, isn't it? So, because Alfie Bass was in um, Alfie. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Not playing the title character. For me, that's <laughs> where you can see the distinction between Lewis Gilbert as a filmmaker and how the Bond films are anomalies within his filmography because he made a lot of films. He made loads of films prior to You Ain't Live Twice. And it's bizarre that the film that he made before You Ain't Live Twice was Alfie. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that explains the Alfie Bass cameo. And for many, many years, I had no idea that that was someone of note. I just thought it was some random guy. Same. (laughs) The one thing I wanted to bring up is that Bond is very famous for its use of product placement in its films. And often it's done... (laughs) quite subtly, other times less subtly, most notably with the uh, Sony Vio computers, which kept getting used yep. whenever they did a Sony James Bond film. They had that thing where every single bit of tech was Sony. I do remember like Casino Royale, one of the things at the time stopped it from being recognised as the brilliant piece of work that it is now. It's just that the yep. advertising in the film is just the product placement is so over the top, and that's Sony to a T. Synergy. Synergy. <laughs> I hate that word. Yeah. But um interesting with this film, I think it has there's one sequence in the film and it has easily the laziest and most obvious implementation of product placement in the whole series. And this is a sequence when after the cable car sequence where Bond and Holly are captured in the ambulance. Yeah. And the ambulance is careening up the hill in Rio. Every time it cuts to a shot outside of the ambulance going up the hill, it keeps running past billboards. And <laughs> each billboard is just an ad for something. Yep. So it's seven up and then it's Marlborough. And then at the end of the sequence, when they have a fight with the henchman and he gets uh, thrown out of the ambulance on the stretcher and he crashes into a billboard and it's a huge billboard for British Airways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just... At least it like it builds up to a punchline. It's really yeah. over the fucking top and garishly in your face. But it's like, at the same time, it's like, let's get all of the uh, advertising out of the way with in this tiny sequence. <laughs> and we'll use it for a joke. It's so on the nose that it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it has the goal to segue into the Magnificent Seven. Yes. Oh, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, that whole bit's just very bizarre. I mean, there's a similar bit in The Spy Love Me where that's when they're in the desert and they cut to the Lawrence of Arabia theme. They they Mm -hmm. kind of recreate that here, but with Magnificent Seven. And then you have all the crazy stuff with Q's gadgets in that courtyard Mm -hmm. with the balls Q, which is always (laughs) a famous quote that... It's probably this film's legacy that it boils down to that one quote of... (laughs) Balls <laughs> cue? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's yeah. when the film really pivots, when they introduce the laser gun, because that's when it's like, ah, oh, this is too much now. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of my favourite gadget scenes in the film is when Bond is going through Holly Goodhead's hotel yeah. room or wherever she's staying, and he's kind of disassembling all her gadgets, all of her CIA gadgets as a way to show that he's figured out who she is and who she represents. And I just wanted one of them to have like a massive dragon dildo that just flops out of it. And he goes, ah, standard CIA issue, I see. You know, just like, does this one implant the eggs? Uh, (laughs) Standard CIA equipment. (laughs) But yeah, Uh, it's like, (laughs) yeah, that's all I could think of when I saw that scene, which tells you where my mind goes, you know. (laughs) This big stars and stripes dildo. Yeah. It's one way you have to salute while you use it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. And then that whole scene has the Bollinger, if it's 69, you were expecting me line, which is yeah, amazing. But you know what? The thing is, I think he cracks a couple of 69 jokes through his tenure, does our Roger Moore. Mm. But he looks like the person least likely to be involved in a 69, you know, anything <laughs> that isn't missionary. You know, I could never imagine Roger Moore at 50 years old being like, hey, feeling kinky tonight. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Let's top and tail, love. Um. <laughs> it is really weird that 
And I think it's because, again, it's down to that age thing and how they dress him and how they present him that from Moonraker onwards, Roger Moore becomes less believable as Bond, but becomes something else. It becomes Roger Moore <laughs> in a yes. way. Yeah, yeah. I think when Lewis Gilbert came to do The Spy Who Loved Me, he'd seen Live and Let Die and Man with the Golden Gun, where Guy Hamilton, the previous director, had tried to make him a little bit more like Sean and be a bit ruthless. Which yeah, is yeah. Very yeah. much in those films. And Lewis Gilbert felt that Roger Moore wasn't suited to doing that and that he needed to embrace the Roger Moreness mm, yeah. of the performance, which is why it became much more comedic. And I think they had a good balance of that in The Spy Who Loved Me. But yeah, it's weird that after that point, whenever you get anything like a a love scene or an action scene, it's never quite right again no yeah exactly it just becomes ah oh, uncle roger kind of thing <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not that yeah. uncle roger but you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a much more relaxed performance the thing is as well we don't really bring attention to it as much as we should do as a culture of bond watches but we don't really bring attention to the fact that he has the best actor's name for a bond character ever roger moore yeah it's like pure perfection for a name for bond and yet we never really bring attention to it it's just there in our faces roger moore it's (laughs) (laughs) yeah he should be like the love interest for gay bond (laughs) gay bond (laughs) yeah (laughs) who's the bond man as a tribute we're gonna call him roger moore roger moore (laughs) or as we're being responsible we're gonna call him roger less (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> i also as well think uh, talking about the villain for a moment i've mentioned about how i don't feel like he's that threatening i also think that the reason that he isn't much of a threat to me is that one of his introductory lines is um, may i press you to a cucumber sandwich mr bond it's like no you may not you dirty bugger <laughs> it's like of all the lines to introduce a villain with <laughs> yeah may i press you for a cucumber sandwich is not particularly up there for a classic. Yeah. (laughs) This is the question I want to ask you. So, in that introductory scene to Drax when he's playing the piano... Yes, yeah. I've watched this film so many times, and I still can't work out whether he's pretending to play the piano or whether he's just playing the piano very badly to the dub. And I can't work it out. Oh, like whether it's like an effect that he's playing f- to the two ladies and he really can't play piano and it's just like an effect or whether it's just the actor not playing along very well to the actual pre-recorded track. <laughs> I can't work yeah, it out. Yeah, no, see, that's what I thought it was. But I didn't really think about what it could mean for the scene, but I just thought it was like one of those, oh, it looks kind of right, that'll do, moments. But yeah, I always just thought it was a bad dub. And watching it this time, I felt the same as well. Like it just... Didn't hit the marks. Yeah. Whereas growing up, I thought that it was in effect and that yeah. Drax couldn't play the piano. I need to watch that again. And he was just putting it on and it was just something where... You gave him way more credit. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was a thing. And then, because obviously I've watched this film loads of times on video and DVD. And then when I bought the Blu-ray, and obviously you can see it in much more detail, it's like, hmm... Is that is yeah, that yeah. what I thought it was, or is it just not done very well? <laughs> so every single time I see the film and it comes to that bit, I was like, what is it? What is it? <laughs> it's a question I this want answered. This is your Da Vinci Code. <laughs> but, right, the thing is, we can't really end our discussion of the film without talking about something in particular that we haven't really talked about all that much for a film that is called Moonraker. Yeah. And that is the space shit. Everything to do with space. Yeah. What did you think of the... I mean, we know it's outlandish, we know it's crazy, but what is your opinion of that final act, that space battle, where it finally takes us into orbit? Um, You know what my favourite thing about it is? Yeah. I love that the moment that the gravity turns off, that all it does to people is just makes them walk very slowly. <laughs> it's like, oh no, the gravity's gone off. We're just going to walk slowly from now on. Yeah, you could tell that they were really struggling with any bit that had, like, zero gravity. 
Yeah. You could do it with one or two people on wires, but whenever it was a load of people, it's like, now nah, we're just going to have everyone be really slow and shoot at high speed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then any other time, we're going to have gravity on. I think it works fine for when they approach the space station and when everyone assembles and then when Drax makes his speech. I think it works fine up until the zero gravity is hit again. 100%. And the space marines approach because obviously, one, that battle is really goofy, but also the logistics of <laughs> the fact that the the US marines are able to launch a space shuttle that quickly <laughs> and get up there that quickly is quite yeah. hilarious. <laughs> it should have exploded. Because the idea of the other space shuttles being on a preset flight plan and everything, I can kind of buy because it's been set up for many years and it's, you know, the planning has been thought out. I mean, how the fuck they got the space station up there in the first place is anyone's guess. But Without anyone noticing. Yeah, but <laughs> it feels meticulously planned. Whereas the space marines just suddenly deciding to go up in their spaceship yeah. to the space station in about 10 minutes mm -hmm. is just stretching it. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and the fact they're all armed with laser guns and it kind of falls apart then. How chaotic does it get as well during the laser battle? And considering yeah. it's something like special effects wise, it was so meticulously planned in terms of how do we do this shot? Well, we've got to run with, we've got to do the wind back method, which we talked about earlier, which means that like they really have to think about the elements and where they are and whatnot. The actual space battle stuff is so fucking hard to follow and so in your face. And there's so many kind of like wild shots running errant, you know, like wild laser yeah. shots just go flying everywhere that I just wanted it to every now and again cut to some random person on Earth, like some guy in Canada mowing his lawn and then he suddenly gets <laughs> obliterated by a laser beam. Just <laughs> ah! a stray laser beam. Yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah. just every now and again it cuts to someone because those lasers are hitting somewhere man <laughs> yeah I described it in my notes it's very similar to the army slash marines coming to save the day in Thunderball Thunderball yeah same where they have you know that extremely long underwater sequence it's very similar to that in it's chaotic nature but it's probably about a quarter of the length yeah so it saves us that because that sequence in Thunderball is excruciatingly long it is, yeah. It's painfully long. <laughs> um, <laughs> is that what they say about Roger Moore? <laughs> um, yeah. Um, yeah, it feels very much a repeat of that. And you can tell that it's the director's style because it's been done in his previous two films. Like, you have it with the ninjas in You Win and Live Twice. Yeah, And you, you do, have yeah. it with the battle with the submarine crews in The Spy Who Loved Me. So you can see what they're trying to do, which is do a version of that. But to be honest, it's easily the worst out of those three. Yes, I think so, yeah. And to be honest, for me personally, I think this is my least favourite of Lewis Gilbert's three films. Oh, I would say so, yeah. This film, I'd say it's less of a document for world culture, but it's more of a document to film trends yes oh, of 100%. the time i'd say yeah even down to the fact that we haven't even talked about the lab scene where the close encounters reference the code for the door is a close encounters theme <laughs> which is just bonkers that's the, like the second reference to a spielberg film that we have in this film obviously the name jaws in the first one yeah spy who loved me that was a reference to jaws the shark as well I believe that when they came up with it. Yeah, yeah, because that particular character from the Spy Who Loved Me novel was originally called Horror. Right, there we go, yeah. So, yeah, they changed the name to fit with that, and, yeah, they thought it would be a nice little gimmick to tie yeah. into, oh, that's something I recognise. <laughs> well, it makes me think that people on the, uh, on the crew sure do like Steven Spielberg. <laughs> I'm never 100% sure of the validity of this story, but... I think Steven Spielberg had approached Eon around 1978 ah, yeah. when he'd finished Close Encounters and offered to direct this film, and they turned him down. But I'm thinking that's more the fact that they had Lewis Gilbert already in place, and also they were riding off the high of Spy Who Loved Me. And also, I think at the time, Cubby was very much into using British crew 
and British directors. The fact that they turned Steven Spielberg down, it sounds crazy on paper, but when you actually go back to how the films were made, it would just not be something that they would consider. Mm. So they would not be in the position where, okay, sorry, Lewis, we're going to go with Steven Spielberg because he's the bigger director. That just would not happen. That's not how Cubby ran the ship. He was based on, you do a good job for me, I will promote you, and every film, if you do a good job, you'll rise up the ranks. But yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, and it is crazy that the fact that they used, they turned him down and then had the cheek to use the closing cat as theme tune. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he must have been sat there going, you bastards. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if I'm talking about a positive with this film, despite how batshit crazy it is, it does have very good setup and payoff throughout. Yeah, You can tell where they've gone, right, we need to have this element, therefore we need to seed it in earlier on in the film. And the Bond films are always pretty good at doing that mm -hmm. anyway, especially when it came to its gadgets. Mm -hmm. I think it was actually um, something they started doing from um, Goldfinger onwards where they would demonstrate a gadget, use it once, and then use yep. it twice. So it was properly bedded in by the time it really needed to be used. And they do that with the whole wrist-activated dart thing. Yeah, they do, yeah. That must be one dangerous wank for James <laughs> Bond with that little wrist-activated gadget. It's like, what do you do when you want to take it off? Because like, <laughs> if it's wrist-activated, what if it goes off by accident and you accidentally hit yeah. someone? You someone asked him for the time and he accidentally fucking... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there's things like that all the way through where, like, for example, like the glass factory, it yeah, sets yeah. it up in such a way that you know that all that glass at some point is going to get smashed to fuck. Of course. <laughs> and when it gets smashed to fuck, it's very satisfying. It really is. And also, like, just the way that they demonstrate how the nerve gas works is quite effective. Mm. It's very good at its visual storytelling. Although Bond is notorious for it's upfront exposition scenes. This film does quite a good job at demonstrating the threat. Yes, yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. It does it early on enough that you don't have to think about it when they're doing all the crazy space stuff because you know what the implications are if mm -hmm. those pod things get through the atmosphere. Yeah, in that way, it's pretty good. And I do like the little like treasure hunt where it finds different elements, like the glass that's part of the infrastructure, and he finds different things, and that's yeah, how he yeah. gets from A to B. I think someone did write, it's quite interesting how Bond, it seems to be really hard work for Bond to find these things, and yet Holly Goodhead seems have no problem um, getting from <laughs> A to B. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> He's kind of, yeah, laboring his way around the world on this little fetch quest. I think it puts Bond on the back foot a lot of the time, even down to the fact that it's Goodhead who's the one that is the trained astronaut and knows how to do all the stuff. So it's very much Bond is passive for quite yeah. a lot of it, which I think is something that they, another reason why the films became more grounded because they wanted to get away from him just going from A to B, mm -hmm. even if going from A to B is quite interesting. But... um as a nuts and bolts thing, even though it's fucking bonkers, it does actually work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a strange way. I mean, when it comes to, like, the space stuff as well, like, I share a very similar opinion to you, in which I think it actually works up until the point where the laser battle begins. Yeah. But I think the bit where um, it kind of loses its way a little bit, and this is also in regards to, as I mentioned earlier, it's like where all of the faults come to a head, where the issue to Holly Goodhead and the performance or portrayal of that character as directed and as written, and also James Bond as well being the kind of character he is. You've got all the chaos of a laser battle happening right outside the window during this scene as well. But just as Holly Goodhead and James Bond are trying to escape on a shuttle from this exploding space station, yeah, it couldn't be more low energy it keeps on showing them just very kind of like calmly strapping themselves into their seats and it's just like da 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 and then it all cuts to like explosion and then like another grand model shot something exploding and another explosion and it cuts right back to them again they're like whoosh, 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 just like <laughs> there's no sense of urgency there's no sense yeah. of threat 
And I think that's like where it all comes to a head for me. It's like, oh yeah, this is where everything doesn't work. Yeah, I think that's where the issues of shooting the film in Paris and mm. the, the special effects being done in, in London really show because I think they did have quite a few issues communications-wise because at the end of the day, I don't even think fax even exists at this point, does it? So No, you know, you're right, aren't you? I think they were talking to each other via Morse code. It's just the telephone, isn't it? And that's it. <laughs> and courier service. Yeah. So that's where, yeah, it doesn't quite marry up. And also, if the special effects would have been done at a different time to when they shot the actual scene, it wouldn't have lined up either. So there is a big disconnect there with how things run. And that's always something that the James Bond films can suffer from time to time because they are unit based. They aren't, it's not one of those situations where, like you have with the Mission Impossible films now, where the director supervises absolutely everything. They yeah. are unit based. So you have multiple units. You have John Glenn's unit doing the free fall sequence, which was actually done ahead of time in yeah, case yeah. it didn't work and they could have thought something else. And then there's another unit headed by Ernest Day that did other action sequences. And then you have the special effects unit and they did all the model stuff and the wire work with the space battle yeah, yeah. outside. And then you've got the main unit, which are doing all the other stuff on the big sets, trying to coordinate that and trying to coordinate it with very primitive communication technology yeah hundreds and hundreds of miles away from each other yeah it's no wonder it's not going to quite marry up no yeah of course and they do their best but yeah it doesn't quite work and again i think it comes down to that some of the old school hands yes yeah if, if it was a, a newer director they probably would have amped up the energy but it just wasn't the style no there's a an often cited quote from lewis gilbert regarding this film is that when he started making films, he could make a feature film for the same cost as the telephone bill for Moonraker. Right, Which shows okay. you, like, that communication thing. Yeah. And the film still has some lovely parts to it as well. Like, we haven't mentioned the whole um, demise of Corinne. I mean, tonally... It's it so mean. Yeah, it's very mean-spirited, and it doesn't really fit in with the rest of the film. It, to be honest, it's one of those sequences that could easily have fit into a Timothy Dalton film. Yeah, exactly. That's what it feels like it was made for. Yeah. John Glenn would have edited that sequence and it's like, you can see where he would go later on because there's even stuff in Octopussy that's a bit like that. Like I remember, when, is it with 00, 009 at the beginning of that film being chased by the uh, Mishka and Grishka twins? It's very similar in terms yeah, yeah. of how it's shot and set up. So you can see the makings of that style, but yeah, it's really cool, but it's so at odds with... Yeah, yeah. This film is so all over the place with that. It's one of those throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks kind of films. That's exactly what it is, yeah. Yeah. But um, that scene also reminds me in the way that it's shot and the reveal at the end, that kind of the way that the camera moves away from the violence. It always reminds me of Reservoir Dogs and uh, yeah. Quentin Tarantino's shooting of the um, dismembered ear. This predates it by quite a considerable amount, but it has that same kind of like energy to it. It's a great moment that sticks out in the film because, as you say, it's a tonal issue, but it's still a well-made little bit of the film as well. I, I yeah. still really like that sequence. As very mean-spirited as it is. I think another little bit that I really like, which is similar in tone, is the part in the Rio Carnival when they're investigating the warehouse and you have Jaws in that clown outfit in the alleyway. coming down the alleyway, and it's still pretty eerie. And I think the thing that makes that whole Jaws thing really jar is that they can set that character up and reintroduce that character into the film in that way, and yeah. then an hour later, he's fucking having champagne with Dolly, <laughs> like going <laughs> saying, here's to us. And it's yeah. like, what the fuck, what... <laughs> redemption arc strangest thing for him it's such a shame because jaws should be that character in that clown suit coming down the alleyway yeah and he should stay like that yeah 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 exactly he's a terrifying figure and a formidable foe yeah and actually another thing that reminded me of the mission impossible films in terms of uh 
a similarity that they share is um that whole sequence also very much reminded me of like uh, silent era films there are no yeah. words it's all very visually based and it's i like where bond smiles back at jaws when he does a smile with his teeth and bond smiles back at him but it's all very like visually silent film type of thing taking place and yeah that's another thing that mission impossible films have done quite well that i feel like roger moore bond has a few moments like that throughout though it's they're clearly taken from the same inspirations yeah even this this film it's not my favorite in the series and it's not even my favorite one of lewis gilbert's and it's not my favorite roger moore there's still things to latch on to and there's still cool bits i love the uh again the glass fight's cool and i like the end of that fight in the clock tower room the lighting is great i've got it in my notes i've wrote that that i wish that sequence took longer like they spent more time yeah. within that room and choreographed more because i like the shot and i like the room and i like the opera singer outside it's a brilliant little moment a brilliant little setup and it's just over too quickly yeah and there's loads of different bits like that in the film but yeah i think it's one of those films where yeah it has some cool things but it just doesn't quite stick the landed yeah it doesn't quite stick the landing and it's less than the sum of its parts for when you sure yeah view it as a whole it's a weird mix, and again, it's like the nostalgia thing going back into it, but I think it's just because it's Bond at its most cheeky. <laughs> For sure. He's very quippy. In what it can get away with as well. like, And it's like that right to the end, like even the fucking yeah. zero-gravity sex scene where, you know, I think he's attempting re-entry, sir, and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention as well, because this is... Um, bernard lee's last film it is yeah at this point he was the longest running element of the series mm. outside of lois maxwell so who doesn't get much of a that's another thing with lewis gilbert films he didn't really like the character of money penny so if you notice in his film she's not very prominent no she's like one line maybe two lines and gone yeah but yeah i think this is quite a decent film for bernard lee to go out on and especially like his last proper scene where they're in um by the canal in Venice yeah. with the whole, um, the little file. Yeah, and he sends Bond on holiday with a knowing wink and a nod. Yeah, it's just that uh, there's a really nice thing in the um, Inside Moonraker documentary from Desmond Llewellyn talking about when they were staying in Venice and him playing the piano and not coming to dinner and they'd come back from their dinner and he was still playing the piano and had a captive audience. And the fact that he says, <laughs> I love that man. Yeah. He was such oh. a nice man. I love that. And it was just like, ah, oh, that's great. Makes it feel like a real family. And what a crazy film to go out on. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is the craziest film you could possibly yeah. go out on. It's like you say, though, he's still like his individual scenes, regardless of the content of the overall film, his individual scenes kind of are a good end to his tenure, really. They close the book well. Yeah. Okay, so now it's time for me and Andy to go over to the stats and facts. Now, this is the part of the episode where we talk about the critical reception of the, to the film and also the box office for the film, just to see how it performed back in the day, back in 1979. Now, Andy, it's your turn to have a look at the critical response. So, can you tell us just how this film was received? Okay, so this is always difficult with these films because... Rotten Tomatoes didn't exist back then, uh, for all you kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, this film has a uh, a 59%, so just rotten, rating on the tomato meter. It's just getting a whiff. Yeah, but that's only from 56 reviews, so that's not even a, a modern preview audience. And I imagine that they're all modern day reviews based on home video releases and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it's got a 43% audience score, but again, that's only based on 50,000 ratings, which is, again, not a lot for these kind of, you know, for yes, of course. Rotten Tomatoes. And the critic consensus is featuring one of the series' more ludicrous plots, but outfitted with primo gadgets and spectacular sets. Moonraker is both silly and entertaining. Yes, it is silly and entertaining. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree. <laughs> The average rating for it is 5.5 out of 10. And to be honest, this is one of those films that's really difficult to review. Yeah. To actually give a rating to, because it depends on your frame of mind and your mood. It does. It also depends on your reaction to that particular bond as well. 
and your preferences. Yeah. And it's strange that the audience score is so low because this is one of those films which is made for the general audience. Yeah. And I think this is more reflected in the review, which is from Roger Ebert. But he says, Bond is played by Roger Moore again, as if they don't know when the end is in sight (laughs) at this point. (laughs) Moore had grown into the role by this time, but Moore was, alas, simply not Connery. He lacked the gift of combining the comic with the sexy. He didn't have Connery's sophisticated smile with just a hint of a drool. To which I suppose we should say, so what? The stars of this movie are Ken Adam, the art director, and Derek Meddings, in charge of the special effects. In addition to the giant space station, they provide lots of little touches, like 007's gondola in Venice, which turns into a speedboat and then miraculously grows wheels. Moonraker is a movie by gadgeteers, for gadgeteers, about gadgeteers. Our age may be losing its faith in technology, but James Bond sure hasn't, and he gave it three out of four. Which is a strong rating. Yeah, and the other rating we have is from IMDb, and they gave it 6.2 out of 10. It is higher than expected from the uh, Rotten Tomatoes, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's never a film that's going to have a super high rating. No. The only rating I would have expected to have been a bit higher would have been the audience score, to be honest, which is yes. quite low. I don't understand why it's that low. I do wonder if it's because the Rotten Tomatoes audience base is skews maybe younger? I don't oh, know. Oh, yeah. I, I would say so. Yeah, and it might be younger, and also if... if you know, you do get an awful lot of people who've just grown up with the Daniel Craig films, and if they go and watch Moonraker, they're going to have a bit of a shock. I will say as well, like I mentioned earlier, Roger Moore was never my favourite Bond, and yet now I rate him just alongside everybody else. I find his films have their own particular charm that make them very rewatchable. Yeah, yeah. And again, <laughs> my wife complains about this constantly, but they are the films that I probably go back to the most if I want to have a... A cosy watch. Yeah, exactly, yeah. A couch day. Nice duvet day with some Roger Moore films. Yeah, that's what they set out to achieve with the Roger Moore films, and they did succeed. You know, there are a couple of glaring lapses from time to time, but you cannot deny that the um, Roger Moore films aren't entertaining because that's what they are. Absolutely. If you want a more book-accurate Bond film, or a more dangerous one. There's plenty more out there. But if you're just wanting to be entertained, then the Roger Moore films are there. That's what I like about this series, is like I say, there's a bond for every occasion. You know, it's like, yeah. no matter what you, your opinion is, or like what you're feeling, there's there's a bond film that kind of matches what you're looking for. And yeah, and I think another thing as well that shows how this film was received at the time, obviously, is the box office. Now we've talked about box office figures previously, especially adjusted for inflation. Uh, You mentioned as well, just in regards to the budget of this film, Uh, but you did mention that the box office was around 35 million. Do you say it was 34 million? It was 34 million, yeah. And what was that adjusted for inflation? So that works at about 160 million. Right. So you can see the jump as well. Like if you're looking at The Spy Who Loved Me, and that was a big jump from, you're going from Man with the Golden Gun costing in today's money 48 million. To Spy Love Me costing seventy three million, to Moonraker costing one hundred and sixty million. Yeah. So you can see there's a huge jump in there is. budget. Domestically, this is at the American box office. It went on to make seventy million, uh, which you had mentioned previously. Now, in regards to the weekend that it opened, there is unfortunately not much information. The weeks of release on Box Office Mojo only go back so far, and I believe like 1978 or is where like they start keeping track of the weekly box office, but some of them just have very incomplete information. And this one just says that Moonraker opened at number one with 7 million on its first weekend, and at number two was Alien, which was in its sixth week of release. And number three was Meatballs, which I don't believe would have actually been in number three because that was only open in 7.30s and made about 70 grand. (laughs) So those are just three films that were there that particular week. We're still dealing with an era where films didn't always open wide. Yes. like I think Bond always used to, but you'd still get situations where a film would only open in either one theatre or just a couple of theatres and then would open wide a few weeks later. And 
even in some extremes, just in certain regions and then would move to another region. It, it was a lot more complicated. Yeah, it's like almost like a roadshow. Well, I know yeah. roadshow films are a different thing, but there's almost like a roadshow quality where they would travel across America with it and then it's suddenly open everywhere after it's kind of drummed up the publicity and the word of mouth and people want to go back. Yeah, and, and to be honest, same date releases, still quite a recent thing, to be honest. They are, yes, yeah. Probably in the last 20 years. Mm. Maybe less, because <laughs> I still remember watching films that came out six months after they did in the States, which yes, I never understood. Yeah, same. And I think they kind of caught on to the fact that same day release actually work better. <laughs> yeah, especially in this pirated video market. It's like, there's, there's oh, yeah. no point in releasing it with any delay. But yeah, it's very difficult to like assess how yeah. a film's doing compared to other films at the time around this period anyway. Well, I can go on to say that in regards to the worldwide total for this film on Box Office Mojo, it does have it listed as $210 million, which adjusted for inflation. Um, again, I know this isn't an exact science, but still, when we adjust that for inflation, it comes in at $884 million. So it's a huge success, this film, no matter which way you cut it as well. And that's what I like about Bond as well, is that regardless of the success, we see it again with Die Another Day, and we've seen it again with other films as well, regardless of how successful they are in terms of money, if they feel that like we didn't really hit the right note with this one, they will look at still rejuvenating and revitalizing. Whereas so many studios are like, doesn't matter if it's bad, it's making money, make more. Yeah. I always like that about Bond is it's always about the long game as well. Yeah. In a way, they probably saw the writing on the wall as well because the film cost quite a lot more than Spy. Yeah. But actually didn't make quite as much money overall at the box office because you compare, like in today's money, this made 884, but Spy made about 990. Yeah, yeah. On half the budget. So you can kind of see where it's like, right, we've made this, but maybe let's be a bit more economical for the next one. Yes, sort of yeah. thing. But at this point, Bond was as successful as it had ever. It had kind of gone back up to nearly the Sean Connery Bond mania heights at this point in the late 70s. Mm. It's something that Bond doesn't really reference all that much when it comes to talking about its box office. It always talks about oh, this one's made more than all the other ones, but actually when you adjust for inflation because the series has been going on for so long, yeah, no, it's about comparable with these films. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, people always talk about, oh, Skyfall's the most successful James Bond movie, and it, <laughs> it isn't definitely there, but it's, you know, if you compare it to Thunderball, which probably made more money. Yeah, you've always got to look at it like, with the context, that's something that I think, like, it's studio-driven that, so that it can say they can celebrate the easy win. Even Cubby Broccoli was doing that, though, because if you watch the Moonraker documentary, he's talking about Spy Love Me. Going, it made more business than even our Sean Connery films. And it's like, it made equal business, but you have to adjust for inflation, Cubby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this whole period is definitely a, a high watermark period for the Bond series mm. after it had a bit of a, a slump and a, and a bit of an identity crisis during the um, early 70s. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I would say, just to like sum up for myself, I mean, I, I, I won't say much different than you, is that um, I think this film has faults. I think this film has fatal flaws, but I still like it, and I like where it stands in the James Bond filmography. I, I like I like revisiting these oddities, and like I mentioned before, seeing what the thinking was behind them, and even with all of that taken away, there's always still some kind of charm to the worst of these films at this point. There's always something to take away. And I think Moonraker, for all of its faults, is still a very entertaining film for me once you get past that first like half an hour or so. But yeah, um, yeah I still think it's a very entertaining film to watch and a very interesting film to watch. Yeah. And again, we've just summed it up. Like, Roger Moore is entertaining with a capital E. Yeah. And that's really the legacy that he left behind with his whole era is that you can say what you want, but those films aren't dull. <laughs> no, they're not. Not at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so that's all we've got time for our latest episode of Popcorn Digest. Now, if you join us next time, we'll be taken to the sewers where we belong, as we'll be watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secrets of the Ooze, which, to be honest, Secrets of the Ooze does sound like something that James Bond might say or do. <laughs> I imagine his ooze has some, some secrets to it. 
<laughs> I don't know. His doctor might say a few things. Yeah, we're unlocking the secret of this discharge. <laughs> yeah. So the secret of the ooze, Mr. Bond, is that you have gonorrhea and uh, <laughs> you're going to need to take these antibiotics for life. <laughs> <laughs> but until then, I've been Gareth. And I've been Roger Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Alan. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Roger!